Hello, my lovelies, and welcome back to Bedtime Stories with Celosia Crane. I had so much fun recording the double episode that I launched Thursday night that I'm going to give you guys another double story. So we're continuing again with the Just So Stories by Rudyard Kipling. And today we are going to start with the story, How the Leopard Got His Spots. In the days when everybody started fair, best beloved, the leopard lived in a place called the High Veldt. Remember, it wasn't the Low Veldt or the Bush Veldt or the Sour Veldt, but the exclusively bare, hot, shiny High Veldt, where there was sand and sandy-colored rock and exclusively tufts of sandy, yellowish grass. The giraffe and the zebra and the eland and the kudu and the heart beast lived there. And they were exclusively sandy yellow brownish all over. But the leopard, he was the exclusiviest, sandiest, yellow brownest of them all, a grayish yellow caddy shaped kind of a beast. And he matched the exclusively yellow grayish brownish color of the high veldt to one hair. This was very bad for the giraffe and the zebra and the rest of them, for he would lie down by a exclusively yellow, grayish, brownish stone or clump of grass. And when the giraffe or the zebra or the eland or the kudu or the bush buck or the bonty buck came by, he would surprise them out of their jumpsome lives. He would indeed. And also, there was an Ethiopian with bows and arrows exclusively grayish, brownish, yellowish man he was then, who lived on the high veldt with the leopard, and the two used to hunt together. The Ethiopian with his bows and arrows, and the leopard exclusively with his teeth and claws. Till the giraffe and the eland and the kudu and the quagga and all the rest of them didn't know which way to jump. Best beloved, they didn't indeed. After a long time, things lived for ever so long in those days, they learned to avoid anything that looked like a leopard or an Ethiopian, and bit by bit, the giraffe began it because his legs were the longest. They went away from the high veldt. They scuttled for days and days and days till they came to a great forest, exclusively full of trees and bushes and stripy, speckly, patchy, blatchy shadows. And there they hid. And after another long time, what with standing half in the shade and half out of it, and what with the slippery, slidey shadows of the trees falling on them, the giraffe grew blotchy, and the zebra grew stripy, and the eland and the kudu grew darker, with little wavy gray lines on their backs like bark on a tree trunk. And so, though you could hear them and smell them, you could very seldom see them. And then only when you knew precisely where to look. They had a beautiful time in the exclusively speckly, spickly shadows of the forest, while the leopard and the Ethiopian ran about over the exclusively grayish, yellowish, reddish high veldt outside, wondering where all their breakfasts and their dinners and their teas had gone. At last they were so hungry that they ate rats and beetles and rock rabbits, the leopard and the Ethiopian, and then they had the big tummy ache, both together. And then they met Bavian, the dog-headed barking baboon, who is quite the wisest animal in all South Africa. Said leopard to Bavian, and it was a very hot day, where has all the game gone? And Bavian winked. He knew. Said the Ethiopian to Bavian, Can you tell me the present habitat of the aboriginal fauna? That meant just the same thing, but the Ethiopian always liked using long words. He was a grown-up. And Bavian winked. He knew. Then said Bavian, the game has gone into other spots, and my advice to you, leopard, is to go into other spots as soon as you can. And the Ethiopian said, 
that is all very fine, but I wish to know whether the aboriginal fauna has migrated. Then said Bavian, The aboriginal fauna has joined the aboriginal flora because it was high time for a change, and my advice to you, Ethiopian, is to change as soon as you can. That puzzled the leopard and the Ethiopian, but they set off to look for the aboriginal flora, and presently, after ever so many days, they saw a great, high, tall forest, full of trees' trunks, all exclusively speckled and sprottled, and spottled and dotted and splashed and slashed and hatched and cross-hatched with shadows. Say that quickly aloud, and you will see how very shadowy the forest must have been. "'What is this?' said the leopard. "'That is so exclusively dark and yet so full of little pieces of light.' "'I don't know,' said the Ethiopian. "'But it ought to be the aboriginal flora. "'I can smell giraffe and I can hear giraffe, but I can't see giraffe.' "'That's curious,' said the leopard. "'I suppose it is because we have just come in out of the sunshine.' I can smell zebra, and I can hear zebra, but I can't see zebra. Wait a bit, said the Ethiopian. It's a long time since we've hunted them. Perhaps we've forgotten what they were like. Fiddle, said the leopard. I remember them perfectly on the high veldt, especially their marrow bones. Giraffe is about seventeen feet high, of exclusively fulvous golden yellow from head to heel, and zebra is about four and a half feet high, of exclusively grey fawn colour from head to heel. Um, said the Ethiopian, looking into the speckly, spickly shadows of the aboriginal flora forest. Then they ought to show up in this dark place like ripe bananas in a smokehouse. But they didn't. The leopard and the Ethiopian hunted all day, and though they could smell them and hear them, they never saw one of them. For goodness sake, said the leopard at tea time, let us wait till it gets dark. This daylight hunting is a perfect scandal. So they waited till dark, and then the leopard heard something breathing sniffily in the starlight that fell all stripy through the branches, and he jumped at the noise, and it smelled like zebra, and it felt like zebra, and when he knocked it down it kicked like zebra, but he couldn't see it. So he said, Be quiet, O oh, you person without any form. I am going to sit on your head till morning, because there is something about you that I don't understand. Presently, he heard a grunt and a crash and a scramble, and the Ethiopian called out, I've caught a thing that I can't see. It smells like giraffe and it kicks like giraffe, but it hasn't any form. Don't you trust it, said the leopard. Sit on its head till the morning, same as me. They haven't any form, any of them. So they sat down on them hard till bright morning time, and then Leopard said, What have you at your end of the table, brother? The Ethiopian scratched his head and said, It ought to be exclusively a rich, fulvous orange tawny from head to heel, and it ought to be giraffe but it's covered all over with chestnut blotches. What have you at your end of the table, brother? And the leopard scratched its head and said, It ought to be exclusively a delicate grayish fawn, and it ought to be a zebra, but it is covered all over with black and purple stripes. What in the world have you been doing to yourself, zebra? Don't you know that if you were on the high veldt, I could see you ten miles off? You haven't any form. Yes, said the zebra, but this isn't the high veldt, can't you see? I can now, said the leopard, but I couldn't all yesterday. 
how is it done? Let us up, said the zebra, and we will show you. They let the zebra and the giraffe get up, and zebra moved away to some little thorn bushes where the sunlight fell all stripy, and giraffe moved off to some tallish trees where the shadows fell all blotchy. Now watch, said the zebra and the giraffe. This is the way it's done. One, two, three, and where's your breakfast? Leopard stared, and Ethiopian stared but all they could see were stripy shadows and blotched shadows in the forest, but never a sign of zebra and giraffe. They had just walked off and hidden themselves in the shadowy forest. Hi, hi, said the Ethiopian, that is a trick worth learning. Take a lesson by it, leopard. You show up in this dark place like a bar of soap in a coal scuttle. Ho, ho, said the leopard. Wouldn't it surprise you very much to know that you show up in this dark place like a mustard plaster on a sack of coals? Well, calling names won't catch dinner, said the Ethiopian. The long and the little of it is that we don't match our backgrounds. I'm going to take Bavian's advice. He told me I ought to change, and as I've nothing to change except my skin— I'm going to change that. What to? said the leopard, tremendously excited. To a nice working blackish brown color with a little purple in it and touches of slaty blue. It will be the very thing for hiding in hollows and behind trees. So he changed his skin then and there, and the leopard was more excited than ever. He had never seen a man change his skin before. But what about me? he said, when the Ethiopian had worked his last little finger into his fine new black skin. You take Bavian's advice, too. He told you to go into spots. So I did, said the leopard. I went into other spots as fast as I could. I went into this spot with you, and a lot of good it has done me. Oh, said the Ethiopian, Bavian didn't mean spots in South Africa. He meant spots on your skin. What's the use of that? said the leopard. Think of giraffe, said the Ethiopian, or if you prefer stripes, think of zebra. They find their spots and stripes give them perfect satisfaction. Um, said the leopard, I wouldn't look like zebra, not for ever so. Well, make up your mind, said the Ethiopian, because I'd hate to go hunting without you, but I must if you insist on looking like a sunflower against a tarred fence. I'll take spots then, said the leopard. But don't make them too vulgar, Big. I wouldn't look like giraffe. Not for ever so. I'll make them with the tips of my fingers, said the Ethiopian. There's plenty of black left on my skin still. Stand over. Then the Ethiopian put his five fingers close together. There was plenty of black left on his new skin still. And pressed them all over the leopard and wherever the five fingers touched, they left five little black marks, all close together. You can see them on any leopard's skin you like, best beloved. Sometimes the fingers slipped and the marks got a little blurred, but if you look closely at any leopard now, you will see that there are always five spots. Ah, five fat black fingertips. Now you are a beauty said the Ethiopian. You can lie out on the bare ground and look like a heap of pebbles. You can lie out on the naked rocks and look like a piece of pudding stone. You can lie out on a leafy branch and look like sunshine sifting through the leaves. And you can lie right across the center of a path and look like nothing in particular. Think of that and purr. But if I am all this, said the leopard, 
why didn't you go spotty too? Oh, plain black is best for me, said the Ethiopian. Now come along, and we'll see if we can't get even with Mr. One, Two, Three. Where's your breakfast? So they went away and lived happily ever afterward, best beloved. That is all. Oh, now and then you will hear grown-ups say, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? I don't think even grown-ups would keep on saying such a silly thing if the leopard in the Ethiopian hadn't done it once. Do you? But they will never do it again, best beloved. They are quite content as they are. I am the most wise Bavian, saying in most wise tones, Let us melt into the landscape, just us two by our loans. People have come, in a carriage, calling, but Mummy isn't there. Yes, I can go if you take me. Nurse says she don't care. Let's go up to the pigsties and sit on the farmyard rails. Let's say things to the bunnies and watch them skitter their tails. Let's, oh, anything, Daddy, so long as it's you and me, and going truly exploring and not being in till tea. Here's your boots, I've brought them, and here's your cap and stick, and here's your pipe and tobacco. Oh, come along out of it, quick. Our next story is The Elephant's Child. In the high and far-off times, the elephant, O oh best beloved, had no trunk. He had only a blackish, bulgy nose as big as a boot that he could wriggle about from side to side. But he couldn't pick up things with it. But there was one elephant, a new elephant, an elephant's child, who was full of satiable curiosity and that meant he asked ever so many questions. And he lived in Africa, and he filled all Africa with his satiable curiosities. He asked his tall aunt, the ostrich, why her tail feathers grew just so, and his tall aunt, the ostrich, spanked him with her hard, hard claw. He asked his tall uncle, the giraffe, what made his skin spotty, and his tall uncle, the giraffe, spanked him with his hard, hard hoof. And still, he was full of satiable curiosities. He asked his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, why her eyes were red. And his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, spanked him with her broad, broad hoof. And he asked his hairy uncle, the baboon, why melons tasted just so. And his hairy uncle, the baboon, spanked him with his hairy, hairy paw. And still, he was full of satiable curiosity. He asked questions about everything that he saw or heard or felt or smelt or touched, and all his uncles and his aunts spanked him, and still he was full of satiable curiosities. One fine morning, in the middle of the procession of the equinoxes, this satiable elephant's child asked a new fine question that he had never asked before. He asked, "'What does the crocodile have for dinner?' Then everybody said, Hush! in a loud and dreadful tone, and they spanked him immediately and directly without stopping for a long time. By and by, when that was finished, he came upon Colo Colo Bird sitting in the middle of a wait a bit thorn bush. And he said, My father has spanked me, and my mother has spanked me, all my aunts and uncles have spanked me for my satiable curiosity. And still, I want to know what the crocodile has for dinner. Then Colo Colo Bird said with a mournful cry, Go to the banks of the great green, gray, greasy Limpopo River. I'll sit about with fever trees and find out. That very next morning, when there was nothing left of the equinoxes, because the procession had proceeded according to precedent, this satiable elephant's child took a hundred pounds of bananas, the little short red kind, and a hundred pounds of sugar cane, the long purple kind, and seventeen melons, the greeny crackly kind, and said to all his dear families, Goodbye, 
I am going to the great gray green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, to find out what the crocodile has for dinner. And they all spanked him once more for luck, though he asked them most politely to stop. Then he went away, a little warm, but not at all astonished, eating melons and throwing the rind about because he could not pick it up. He went from Graham's town to Kimberley, and from Kimberley to Kama's country, and from Kama's country he went east by north, eating melons all the time. Till at last he came to the banks of the great gray-green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, precisely as the Colo Colo bird had said. Now you must know and understand, O oh best beloved, that till that very week and day and hour and minute the satiable elephant's child had never seen a crocodile, and did not know what one was like. It was all his satiable curiosity. The first thing that he found was a bi-colored python rock snake curled around a rock. "'Excuse me,' said the elephant's child most politely, "'but have you seen such a thing as a crocodile in these promiscuous parts?' "'Have I seen a crocodile?' said the bicolored python rock snake in a voice of dreadful scorn. What will you ask me next? Excuse me, said the elephant's child, but could you kindly tell me what he has for dinner? Then the bicolored python rock snake uncoiled himself very quickly from the rock and spanked the elephant's child with his scalesome, flailsome tail. That is odd, said the elephant's child, because my father and my mother and my uncle and my aunt, not to mention my other aunt, the hippopotamus, and my other uncle, the baboon, have all spanked me for my satiable curiosity. And I suppose this is the same thing. So he said good-bye very politely to the bi-colored python rock snake and helped him to coil up on the rock again and went on, a little warm but not at all astonished eating melons and throwing the rind about because he could not pick it up, till he trod on what he thought was a log of wood at the very edge of that great gray-green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees. But it was really the crocodile, O oh best beloved, and the crocodile winked one eye, like this. "'Excuse me,' said the elephant's child most politely, but do you happen to have seen a crocodile in these promiscuous parts? Then the crocodile winked the other eye and lifted half his tail out of the mud. And the elephant's child stepped back most politely because he did not wish to be spanked again. Come hither, little one, said the crocodile. Why do you ask such things? Excuse me, said the elephant's child most politely. But my father has spanked me, my mother has spanked me, not to mention my tall aunt, the ostrich, and my tall uncle, the giraffe, who can kick ever so hard, as well as my broad aunt, the hippopotamus, and my hairy uncle, the baboon, and including the bicolored python rock snake with the scalesome flailsome tail, just up the bank, who spanks harder than any of them. And so, if it's quite all the same to you, I don't want to be spanked any more. Come hither, little one, said the crocodile, for I am the crocodile. And he wept crocodile tears to show it was quite true. Then the elephant's child grew all breathless and panted and kneeled down on the bank and said, You are the very person I have been looking for all these long days. Will you please tell me what you have for dinner? Come hither, little one, said the crocodile, and I'll whisper. Then the elephant's child put his head down close to the crocodile's musky, tusky mouth, and the crocodile caught him by his little nose, which up to that very week, day, hour, and minute had been no bigger than a boot, though much more useful. I think, said the crocodile, and he said it between his teeth like this, I think today I will begin with elephant's child. At this, O oh best beloved, the elephant's child was much annoyed, and he said, speaking through his nose like this, Let go! You're hurting me! Then the bicolored python rock snake scuffled down from the bank and said, 
My young friend, if you do not now immediately and instantly pull as hard as ever you can, it is my opinion that your acquaintance in the large pattern leather ulster, and by this he meant the crocodile, will jerk you into the yonder limpid stream before you can say Jack Robinson. This is the way bicolored rock python snakes always talk. Then the elephant's child sat back on his little haunches and pulled and pulled and pulled, and his nose began to stretch. And the crocodile floundered into the water, making it all creamy with great sweeps of his tail, and he pulled and pulled and pulled. And the elephant's child's nose kept on stretching. And the elephant's child spread all his little four legs and pulled and pulled and pulled, and his nose kept on stretching. And the crocodile threshed his tail like an oar, and he pulled and pulled and pulled. And at each pull, the elephant's child's nose grew longer and longer, and it hurt him he just. Then the elephant's child felt his legs slipping, and he said through his nose, which was now nearly five feet long, This is too much for me. Then the bicolored python rock snake came down from the bank and knotted himself in a double clove hitch around the elephant child's hind legs and said, Rash and inexperienced traveler, we will now seriously devote ourselves to a little high tension, because if we do not, it is my impression that yonder self-propelling man of war with the armor-plated upper deck, and by this beloved he meant the crocodile will permanently vitate your future career. That is the way all bicolored python rock snakes always talk. So he pulled, and the elephant's child pulled, and the crocodile pulled, but the elephant's child and the bicolored python rock snake pulled hardest. And at last the crocodile let go of the elephant child's nose with a plop that you could hear all up and down the Limpopo. Then the elephant's child sat down most hard and sudden, but first he was careful to say thank you to the bicolored python rock snake, and next he was kind to his poor pulled nose and wrapped it all up in cool banana leaves and hung it in the great green greasy limpopo to cool. What are you doing that for? said the bicolored python rock snake. Excuse me said the elephant's child, but my nose is badly out of shape and I am waiting for it to shrink. Then you will have to wait a long time, said the bicolored python rock snake. Some people do not know what is good for them. The elephant's child sat there for three days waiting for his nose to shrink, but it never grew any shorter, and besides, it made him squint. For, O oh best beloved, you will see and understand that the crocodile had pulled it out into a really truly trunk, same as all the elephants have today. At the end of the third day, a fly came and stung him on the shoulder, and before he knew what he was doing, he lifted up his trunk and hit that fly dead with the end of it. Vantage number one, said the bicolored python rock snake. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Try and eat a little now. Before he thought what he was doing, the elephant's child put out his trunk and plucked a large bundle of grass, dusted it clean against his forelegs, and stuffed it into his own mouth. Vantage number two, said the bicolored python rock snake. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Don't you think the sun is very hot here? It is said the elephant's child, and before he thought what he was doing, he slooped up a sloop of mud from the banks of the great gray, green, greasy Limpopo, and slapped it on his head, where it made a cool, sloopy, sloshy mud cap, all trickly behind his ears. Vantage number three, said the bicolored python rock snake. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Now how do you feel about being spanked again? Excuse me, said
said the elephant's child, but I should not like it at all. How would you like to spank somebody? said the bicolored python rock snake. I should like it very much indeed, said the elephant's child. Well, said the bicolored python rock snake, you will find that new nose of yours very useful to spank people with. Thank you, said the elephant's child. I'll remember that, and now I think I'll go home to all my dear families and try. So the elephant's child went home across Africa, frisking and whisking his trunk. When he wanted fruit to eat, he pulled fruit down from a tree instead of waiting for it to fall as he used to do. When he wanted grass, he plucked grass up from the ground instead of going on his knees like he used to do. When the flies bit him, he broke off the branch of a tree and used it as a fly whisk, and he made himself a new, cool, slushy, squishy mud cap whenever the sun was hot. When he felt lonely walking through Africa, he sang to himself down his trunk, and the noise was louder than several brass bands. He went especially out of his way to find a broad hippopotamus. She was no relation of his, and he spanked her very hard to make sure that the bicolored python rock snake had spoken the truth about his new trunk. The rest of the time he picked up the melon rinds that he had dropped on his way to the Limpopo, for he was a tidy pachyderm. One dark evening he came back to all his dear families, and he coiled up his trunk and said, How do you do? They were very glad to see him, and immediately said, Come here and be spanked for your satiable curiosity. Pooh, said the elephant's child, I don't think you people know anything about spanking, but I do, and I'll show you. Then he uncurled his trunk and knocked two of his dear brother's head over heels. Oh, bananas, they said, where did you learn that trick, and what have you done to your nose? I got a new one from the crocodile on the banks of the great gray green greasy Limpopo River said the elephant's child. I asked him what he had for dinner, and he gave me this to keep. It looks very ugly, said his hairy uncle the baboon. It does, said the elephant's child, but it's very useful, and he picked up his big hairy uncle the baboon by one hairy leg and shoved him into a hornet's nest. Then that bad elephant's child spanked all his dear families for a long time, till they were very warm and greatly astonished. He pulled out all his tall ostrich ant's tail feathers and caught his tall uncle the giraffe by the hind leg and dragged him through a thorn bush. And he shouted at his broad ant, the hippopotamus, and blew bubbles into her ear when she was sleeping in the water after meals. But he never let anyone touch Colo Colo Bird. At last things grew so exciting that his dear family went off one by one in a hurry to the banks of the great gray green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, to borrow new noses from the crocodile. When they came back, nobody spanked anybody any more, and ever since that day, O oh best beloved, all the elephants you will ever see, besides those that you won't, have trunks precisely like the trunk of that satiable elephant's child. I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names were what and where and when and how and why and who. I send them over land and sea. I send them east and west. But after they have worked for me, I give them all a rest. I let them rest from nine till five, for I am busy then, as well as breakfast, lunch, and tea, for they are hungry men. But different folks have different views. I know a person small. She keeps ten million serving men who get no rest at all. She sends them abroad on her own affairs, for the second she opens her eyes, one million hows, two million wares, and seven million whys. And that was the end of The Elephant's Child. I hope you guys enjoyed these stories. I know I've really been enjoying rediscovering them. I vaguely recalled the Elephant's Child, and How the Rhinoceros Got His Skin from my own mother reading me these stories when I was a child. So it's been a delight to revisit and learn the new ones that I don't remember. Thank you all for listening, and I will see you again next Sunday. 
because our release days, as you recall, are being moved from Saturday to Sunday. I hope you guys all have a great week, and thank you for listening. Bedtime Stories with Celosia Crane is funded entirely by my Patreon. If you guys are enjoying these stories, please consider becoming a patron for the mere amount of $1 a month. This gets you access to a lot of great things, to my newest fiction work that I am working on. The first four chapters of that are up. Uh, Children of Nyx Shades. Uh, which is a combination of Victorian society and Greek mythology, and I'm having lots of fun with it.